In this video, we're going to make the classic game Space Invaders with JavaScript on an HTML canvas. We have our enemies at the top of the screen, they move side to side and down towards our player. At random, the enemies will shoot bullets. At the bottom of the screen, we have our spaceship which can shoot at the enemies. Unlike the original game, our bullets shoot much faster, which also makes the game much more fun. The objective is to stay alive, avoid the enemy bullets, and eliminate the enemies before they reach the bottom of the screen. We also have sounds in the game. We have a sound for when we shoot bullets and when enemies get eliminated. The addition of sound makes the game more immersive and much more fun to play. This is Coding with Adam, and let's get to the code. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, like, and share. For this project, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code, and for our browser, we're going to be using Chrome. For this game, we're also going to have several images, and we're going to have sound. You can find those links down in the description. Some of the images we're going to be using are for our enemies, so we have various colors of our enemies here. We also have our player represented by this spaceship and we have this space background that we're going to be using. And then for the sound we have our enemy death sound and the shooting sound that our player makes when bullets are shot. To start our project we're going to go ahead and create our index.html and we'll also create an index.js for our JavaScript. Let's get started with the index.html. So go to the index.html file and we're going to put an exclamation. And if we hit tab, it's going to go ahead and create the boilerplate HTML inside Visual Studio Code. It's going to hit tab a couple of times here and we'll just add a title of Space Invaders. Inside the body, we'll go ahead and add an H1 and we'll give it a title of Space Invaders. Before we go any further, let's make sure that our HTML is working correctly. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and install an extension called Live Server. So click over here, type in Live Server, and then click the Install button if you haven't already. Then go back to our document, right click on the index.html, and say Open with Live Server. Now we can see our index.html inside of Chrome over here. Now the great thing about Live Server is that if I make any modifications to my HTML and click Save, it will automatically refresh the browser. So you see I changed it so it just says space and now it says space inside of Chrome. If I put invaders back, click save, we'll see space invaders. Well, let's go ahead and add the rest of the HTML. So we're going to go ahead and add our canvas over here and we're going to give it an ID of game and then we're going to add a script tag and we're going to set it as type is equal to modules because we're going to be using imports and exports and src is equal to index.js close that up next we'll go ahead and we're just going to add some styling for our html so inside of our head tag go ahead and add a style tag the first thing we're going to style is our canvas so we're going to add a box shadow for this we're going to add the color black we're going to use 20 20 pixels, 10 pixels offset, and 50 pixels blur. Save that, and now you can see our canvas is kind of floating off the page. And that's all we need for our canvas. Then we can go ahead and just style our H1. We'll set the margin to 0 pixels. We'll set the margin bottom to 10 pixels to put a gap between it and the canvas. And we'll set a font size of 2.9 em and we're going to go ahead and set the font family to helvetica we'll set a few styles on our body as well we're going to use a display of flex in order to go ahead and just center all the items on the screen we're going to use a flex direction of column and our line items will be centered so you can see that it's now centered on the screen then all we're going to do is we're just going to remove all the padding on the page and just set that to zero pixels we'll remove all the margins as well and set that to zero pixels and then we're going to go ahead and set a height of 100 VH. So VH is viewport height. And we're going to set a background over here. I'm just going to use a linear gradient and it's going to be ever so subtle. All it's going to do is just add a little bit of uh, white to kind of gray shadow across the entire page, which I think looks rather cool with our Space Invaders game. We're just going to double check that our JavaScript is working as expected by putting a console.log of test. Then we're going to go ahead and open up our Chrome developer tools. And we'll just confirm in the console tab that we have the message of test. 
And now we can get to work on setting up our basic game loop over here. So let's go ahead and start by getting our canvas. So we'll find our canvas with our document dog element by ID. And we're going to look for game because in our HTML, we named it with the identifier of game. Then from that canvas, we're going to go ahead and get the CTX. We'll say canvas .get context, and we're going to get a 2D context over here. So we just pass in 2D. And then on our canvas, we'll go ahead and set our width and our height. So we're going to set the width equal to 600, and we'll set the height equal to 600 as well. We'll then create a variable for our background. So we're going to create a background variable over here that's going to point to our background image. So make sure that you've downloaded the assets and you have the images folder with all the images inside it. So the path for the images is going to be images slash space dot PNG. And you can see that over here. If we look back at our Explorer, we go to images and you can see there's a space dot PNG. Then we can go ahead and set up our game loop. We'll just create a function called game. It can have any name, but I'm going to call it game. In order for our game loop to work, we have to call it over and over. What we're going to do is we're going to use set interval and we're going to set interval is going to call the game function. Remember, don't put parentheses here, just game. And then it's going to be 1000 divided by 60 because this is milliseconds. And what this means is we're essentially calling the game loop 60 times every one second. For a more detailed explanation of the game loop, you can check out my introduction to game development tutorial with JavaScript. However, for the game loop over here, we're going to test that it is working. We'll just do a console.log and we'll type game over here. And if you look at your log and you see that number incrementing like crazy, that means it's being called 60 times every one second. We can go ahead and delete our console log and we'll draw the background image, pass in the background image, start in the corner for the X and Y position. So right over here in the canvas. And we want our background to cover the entire canvas. So we're gonna make it the same size as our canvas. So give it the same height and the width. The first feature of our game that we're going to build is our enemy movement. Let's take a look at the game over here to see how the enemies move. As we can see, when the enemies hit the edge, they'll move down a little bit and then move in the opposite direction. So they hit this edge down, hit this edge down, and then the opposite direction. So let's start by implementing our enemy movement. In order to implement our enemy movement, we're going to create something called the enemy controller. The enemy controller will be responsible for managing all of our enemies and moving them in a group. Well, let's start by creating a new file. So we'll create a file called enemy controller. Inside the enemy controller, we'll go ahead and just do a default export for now. So export default class enemy controller. And then we'll go back to our index.js over here. And we're just going to import our enemy controller and make sure to put the JS at the end and the dot slash over here just means the current directory. If you've done this correctly, you shouldn't see any errors. We should still see the background. If you do have a typo, like we add some extra letters over here, you'll see that you get an error in your console, letting you know that it can't find that import. So I'll just undo that, save it, and you see everything works. We'll go ahead and declare an instance of the enemy controller. The enemy controller will also take in the canvas. So we'll go back to our enemy controller and we'll declare a constructor and we'll pass in the canvas and we'll just set the canvas. We'll go back to our index.js. Now inside of our game loop, we're going to go ahead and tell our enemy controller to go ahead and draw. It's going to take in the CTX. As soon as we do that, we're going to get an error that the draw method is not implemented. So we'll go back to our enemy controller, implement that draw method, pass in the CTX, click save, and the error message will go away. To confirm that this really is calling the draw method, we can also put a console.log and we can put draw inside here. And we can see that we're getting our draw console message from our enemy controller. The first thing that we're going to do inside of our enemy controller is go ahead and create our enemies. The way we're going to do this is we're going to have an array of enemies to represent the rows of enemies that we have in our game. So if we take a look at this game over here, you can see that we have several different rows. In every single row, there are 10 enemies. They can have any number of enemies that you want. We're going to use a similar concept as a tile map. 
What we're going to do is we're going to create an array called enemy map. Enemy map will be an array that contains other arrays. So each of the inner arrays are the rows. Now the way this works over here is we have these different numbers and these different numbers will represent the different enemies that we have. As it happens, we've named our images to correspond to the numbers in our array. If we take a look at our enemies, they are named enemy 1, 2, and 3. 3. Instead of our array, we use number 1s to represent the orange enemies, 3 to represent the blue ones, and 2s are represented by the green enemies. You can see the structure over here. There's a whole bunch of 1s in the first two rows. In the middle, we got those 3s surrounded by the 2s. And if we look at the actual working game over here, you'll see that we have that structure. These are the 3s in the middles, these are the 1s in the top, and these are the 2s over here at the bottom with the green, and also on the sides. You can feel free to copy this array structure here or change it into a different structure if you like. You can have any number of rows or columns. You just don't want to exceed the size of the canvas. All right, so the first thing we're going to do over here inside our constructor is we're going to create a new method that we're going to be calling called create enemies. It'll be called when we create our enemy controller. When we save that, we're going to get an error letting us know that method doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and implement that method. The error message goes away when we save, and we can also delete the console log. The entire idea behind this enemy map is that we're going to convert these numbers into actual enemy objects. That will be stored inside of another array called enemy rows, and that will be set to an empty list. Inside of create enemies, we're going to go ahead and take that enemy map, and then take all the items that are inside there and create enemies inside of our enemy rows. So we're going to do a for each, and that for each is going to represent the row, and we're also going to get the row index. So this is our arrow function, and inside of this arrow function, we're going to go ahead and say this.enemyRows, and we're going to add an empty array for that row, which means at this point, what we've done is we've added the same number of rows that we have in our enemy map, which is six, to our enemy rows array. Now that we've created an empty row instead of our enemy rows array, we're going to take the row, which represents all the different numbers for a particular row, and map that to a list of enemy objects. We'll take our row object over here and we'll do another for each, and that's going to take in an arrow function once again. The first parameter of that arrow function will be the enemy number. So that's going to be number one, two, or three. Then the second parameter is going to be the enemy index. So this is the position that we are within the array. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the enemy number that we find in every single one of these rows and convert them to enemy objects and place them inside the enemy rows array. Before we do that conversion, let's just make one little change to our tile map. We're going to introduce the concept of using a zero. So zero represent that no enemy is present in that location. By doing this, we're also justifying the reason as to why we're using for each versus using the map function. The map function can convert one array to another array. However, with the for each, we sometimes need to skip some of these spots. And we're going to be using the row index and the enemy index in order to position our enemies. That is why we're using the for each. Inside our for each, we'll do an if. And the first thing we're going to check is if the enemy number is greater than zero. If it is greater than zero, then we can go ahead and push that enemy onto our list. So we'll get our enemy rows over here and we'll get our row index that it's representing right now. And we'll go ahead and push our enemy on. We'll create a new enemy. We'll set the enemy X position. So to set the X position, we're going to go ahead and use the enemy index. So the enemy index is the column and that's where X position is going to be. We're going to say enemy index times and we're going to times 50. So this is where we're going to place it on the screen and you'll see we can change these numbers later and you'll see we can create different gaps between our enemies. So we're going to take our row index as well which is kind of like our y position and times it by 35 and then we're going to pass in our enemy number. So our enemy number is the number from our enemy map over here and will represent the different image that we use for our enemy. 
when we save this, we're going to get an error because our enemy doesn't exist. If we look at our console over here, it tells us that the enemy is not defined. Let's go ahead and create our enemy. We'll add a new file called enemy.js. Inside enemy.js, we're going to do an export default class of enemy. We'll go ahead and create the constructor, which takes in an X, a Y, and the image number. We'll assign the X equal to X and this dot Y equal to Y. And we're not going to assign the image number. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create an image. So let's say this dot image is equal to new image. And then we're going to assign this dot image dot SRC is equal to, and we're going to use a back tick. That's the key next to the one, which does a tick, because we're going to use string interpolation. So we'll do images, which is our directory. Then we're going to get enemy. And over here, we're going to pass in a value. And that value is going to be the image number. And then dot PNG. So this will get our image dynamically. We're going to get one of three enemies. So if we go back to our directory over here and we look at images, we're going inside the images directory. Then we're getting an enemy and we're looking for one of those image numbers, one, two, or three. And this information will be coming from our tile map. So if we go back to our enemy controller and we look over here, we have these numbers. And then these numbers are being passed into our enemy over here as the enemy number. We'll go back to our enemy and inside our enemy, what we're going to do is going to go ahead and add the width and the height. For the width, I'm going to set it to 44. And for the height, I'm going to be setting it to 32. In fact, all we're doing is setting it to the dimensions of the image. If we go to image one over here, enemy one, and we look at the bottom, you'll see it's 44 by 32, which are the same dimensions that we're using in the constructor. So you get rid of our current error right now. We need to go ahead and import our enemy into our enemy controller. Controller. So back in our enemy controller, we'll go ahead and do an import. And we're going to import our enemy from the enemy file that we have. So just choose enemy.js. Then if we refresh our application, the error should go away. Next, we're going to go ahead and we're going to draw our enemies. We're going to start with our enemy controller. Our enemy controller has a draw method. Inside the draw method, we're going to call a new method that hasn't been created yet called this.drawEnemies. And it's going to take in the CTX. Then below that, we can go ahead and define that method. Then we're going to go ahead and loop over all of our enemy rows. And the idea here is we're going to tell each enemy to draw itself. First, to do this, enemy rows is a two-dimensional array like this. What we're going to do is we're going to make it into one big flat array with all of our enemies inside it. In order to do that, there is an array method called flat. This will make one flat structure for your array. Then for each item, we're going to go ahead and call the draw method. So this takes in an arrow function. So we take our enemy. Then what we're going to do is all we're going to do is call enemy.draw and we're going to pass in the CTX. Now notice I put these braces over here. That's because later on, we're going to add a little bit more functionality instead of doing just one action. If we're doing just one action, I could remove those braces and just put enemy draw. But for now, this will make it much easier. We can go ahead and save that and we're going to get an error. That error is that the enemy doesn't have a draw method. Let's go ahead and implement our draw method on the enemy. So inside our enemy, go ahead and add a draw method pass in that CTX. We'll use the CTX to call draw image. Draw image will take in an image as its first argument. So we'll pass in the image. Then we'll pass in the X position, the Y position, and the height and the width of the image that we want. So we'll pass in the width and the height, all things that we've created within our constructor. Click save and your images will appear on the screen. Now that we have our images on the screen, we can go back to our enemy controller. And with our enemy controller, we can go back to our create enemies. And remember these numbers that we placed over here? Well, if we remove those numbers, let's say I remove the 50, all of the enemies will be drawn on top of another. So this is creating the gap that we have between them. Of course, 50 looks really good, but if you want to create a slightly bigger gap, let's put 70. So there's a little bit more space in between them. Of course, you may want to take your tile map over here and reduce the number of enemies that you have so they don't go off 
screen. Same thing with the row index times 35. If we increase that number, it increases the distance vertically between the enemies. We'll go back to using 35 over here and 50 over here as that looks pretty good for our Space Invaders game. Next thing we're going to focus on is moving our enemies. If we take a look at the demo that I showed at the beginning of the video, you can see our enemies typically move in one direction, then switch to another. In order to track this, we're going to go ahead and create a set of constants. We'll create a new file called moving direction. Inside moving direction, we'll go ahead and define an object called moving direction. Inside moving direction, we're going to go ahead and define all the different directions that our space invaders can move in. First, there's left, which will assign to zero, right, which will assign to one. Now, this direction is kind of two directions. We're going to say that our enemies will go down and then they need to start moving left. And we'll define that as two. Now we'll do down right as well. So when they move down on this side of the screen, they start moving right afterwards. Now these numbers could be anything. What's more important is that they identify which direction they're moving in and it's going to be easy to read code that we're going to be using inside of our enemy controller. The last thing we need to do is go ahead and export our moving direction. So we'll export that as the default. Then we can go to our enemy controller, scroll up to the top, and we'll import the moving direction from movingdirection.js. Now we can go ahead and define a few properties that we're going to need on our enemy controller. The first one that we're going to define is the current direction. And I'm defining this just above the constructor in our enemy controller class. We'll go ahead and say current direction is equal to our new moving direction that we defined. And our first direction that our enemies will move in will be right. We'll also define an X velocity. So this is the direction that we're going to be moving horizontally and what velocity that number will be. We'll just assign it to zero by default. We'll also define a y velocity for when we're moving down. And then we're just going to define a couple of variables called default x velocity is equal to one. And we'll have our default y velocity, which is also equal to one. So if we wanted to, we could decide that our enemies move faster when they move down and move slower when they go left to right. For now, I'm going to leave these numbers at 1. Then we'll go ahead and add a new method inside our draw called update velocity and direction. We'll define that method below. So every single time we go to draw, we're going to go ahead and update our velocity and direction of our enemies. The first direction that we're going to focus on is moving right. Now the way Space Invaders works is that the very first enemy on the right that hits the edge will cause all the other enemies to switch directions. To illustrate that, I've updated the example over here so that this enemy on the second row hits first. Since that enemy hits first, it causes all the other enemies to switch direction. We're going to start by focusing on our enemies moving in the right direction. This means that we're going to have to loop over every single row of enemies and go ahead and check what the most furthest right enemy is and whether or not they are touching the wall. Inside of our update velocity and direction method, we're going to go ahead and just do a loop where we're going to loop over the enemy rows. So we'll get our enemy rows. Then what we're going to do is we're going to check if the current moving direction, so we'll get the current direction is equal to moving direction of of right. And if it is a moving direction of right, we'll go ahead and set the x velocity equal to this dot default x velocity, which is going to be one. And then we'll just set our y velocity equal to zero. So to start off simple, we just want to get our enemies moving to the right. Using the x velocity that we defined inside of our enemy controller, we'll need to pass the information down into the enemies. The easiest place to do that is inside of our draw enemies. Inside the draw enemies method, we'll go ahead and instruct our enemies to move based on the values that we set for the x velocity and the y velocity. We'll just call it enemy.move and we'll say this.x velocity and this.y velocity and pass those values in. We'll get an error letting us know that the enemy.move 
remove function doesn't exist. Then we can go inside of our enemy file. Inside of our enemy file, we're going to add that move method. The move method takes in the x velocity and the y velocity. Then all we have to do is this dot x plus equals x velocity and this dot y plus equals our y velocity. Save that and we'll have our enemies moving to the right. Now that our enemies are moving right, we're going to go ahead and detect the edge of the screen with our rightmost enemy. Well, let's go back to our enemy controller in our update to velocity and direction method. When we're moving in the right direction and we're looping over our enemy rows, now each enemy row is each and every single one of these line items over here, and it represents all the enemies on that row. So all we have to do is get the last item in that that array. Then we can take our rightmost enemy and check if it's hitting the edge of the canvas. As you recall, inside our constructor, we have a reference to our canvas and we've assigned it to this dot canvas. All we have to do is just check if our rightmost enemy dot x plus the rightmost enemy width, since we always start drawing from the top left corner, we have to add our width to our enemy in order to figure out its location on the most right side. And then we're just going to check if it's greater than or equal to this.canvas.width. And if it is, then we're going to change the current moving direction. So we're going to say that the current moving direction is going to be equal to moving direction dot down and left. So once we hit the edge, we want to move down and then move left. The other thing we can do here is we can add a break. By putting a break over here, we're exiting our for loop earlier and possibly giving us a tiny performance boost. Despite us changing the current direction to down left, our enemies continue to move right off the screen. In order to handle this, we need to implement the next direction that we change to. So what we're going to do is we're going to check if the current direction is equal to moving direction dot down left. If it is equal to down left, let's go ahead and set our x velocity to zero. This will stop our enemies from moving. Let's go ahead and try that. We hit the edge and we stop moving. The next thing we need to do is move in a downward direction. In order to do that, we need to change our y velocity. So we're going to use this dot y velocity is equal to default y velocity. And now our enemies will move in a downward direction. However, they don't stop and change direction because there isn't anything to stop them. So in order to handle down, we need to set a timer and decide that our enemies move down for a certain period of time and then move horizontally. To handle this, we're going to add a couple of new properties. We'll scroll up to where we've defined our properties and we're going to add a move down timer default, which we'll set to 30. Then we'll go ahead and define our move down timer. And we're going to say that this is equal to the default value that we've decided. So the way this is going to work, we're going to count this value down. When it hits a zero, we'll get the enemies to start moving in a horizontal direction and reset the move down timer for the next time the enemies need to move down. We'll go back down to our down left and we're going to change this implementation a little bit since down left and down right are going to be pretty much similar with one little difference the direction that we want to change to. So let's do this change right now. We're going to call a new function called move down and move down we're going to pass in the direction that we want to go in after the timer is done. So we'll say moving direction dot left for down left. And then if this is true, that means we change direction. So we're going to break once again, giving us a tiny little performance boost because we're not looping over the other rows. Then we'll implement the move down function over here. And it's going to take in the new direction that we want to go in. And all we have to do is pass in this info here. So we're setting the x velocity and the y velocity. After this change, just make sure that your game is still working and that the enemies are moving in a down direction. The next thing we're going to do in our move down method is we're going to check if the move down timer is less than or equal to zero. If it is, then we're going to go ahead and set the current direction. And we'll set the current direction to the new direction that we've passed into this method. And if this is true, we're going to return true over here and set our if. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and return false. 
And this will be used by our if statement over here to go ahead and break out of that loop if it needs to, if we decide we are changing direction. The next thing that we need to do is we need to decrement our timer. So we have our move down timer, but the value is always the same. The place where we're going to decrement our move down timer is going to be inside our draw method. Every single time we call draw, we're going to go ahead and reduce that value. So we'll create a new method called decrement move down timer. Then inside the implementation of this method, we're going to go ahead and check if this dot current moving direction is equal to a down direction. So first we're going to check the left and we'll do an or. So it's either one of these directions. And if either one of these is true, we're going to go ahead and reduce that value. The other thing that we're going to need to do is reset the timer. And we're going to do that also inside the draw method. We're going to go ahead and add another method called reset move down timer. This is going to be fairly simple. Inside of this method, all we need to do is check if the move down timer is less than or equal to zero. Then we're going to go ahead and just set the move down timer back to the default value. To make sure your code is working as expected, you can do this quick little test inside the draw method, do a console.log, then put this dot move down timer. Then let's look at our console and watch that value. As we start to move down, we see the value gets back to zero and then all of a sudden goes back to 80 because it's been reset. You may notice that my move down animation timer default is set to 80 right now. That's just so that I could see the enemies moving downward for a little bit longer. I will be changing it back to 30 once we finish all the different directions Next, let's go ahead and get our enemies to start moving left. Let's go back to our updated velocity and direction method. Now we're going to go ahead and add another else if, and that else if is going to check the current direction. And if the current direction is equal to moving a direction of left, we're going to go ahead and set the x velocity. So this time when we set the x velocity, we're going to be moving left, which means it needs to be a negative number. When it's a negative number, all we have to do is put a minus and we're going to get this dot x velocity the default value, which is one, and we're switching it to a negative. And let's keep it like that for a second, because this is going to be interesting. Now you see we moved down and now we're going diagonal. We're supposed to go left. Well, that's because the Y value is still set to one. So let's go ahead and set our Y velocity equal to zero. Now when we're moving down, our timer will finish and then we'll start to move left. Now we just need to go ahead and do that boundary check on the canvas and then switch the direction to down right. In order to check for our boundary condition, we're going to have to go and get the leftmost enemy. Fortunately, this is really easy. We just have to get the first item in the array. So we'll go ahead and define leftmost enemy, and we're going to assign it to enemy row and position zero in the array. Then all we have to do is go ahead and check if the leftmost enemy dot x is less than or equal to zero. If it is, is, then we're going to go ahead and reset our current direction equal to the moving direction of down right. And we're also going to go ahead and do a break, which will give us, as I said, that tiny little performance boost. Lastly, we can go ahead and implement our last direction down right. So I'm just going to go ahead and add it at the very end of our else ifs over here. A little quick tip is we could break these down into even smaller methods. This would be a lot cleaner and easier to read. However, I think for the purposes of this tutorial, this is okay. So the very last thing we're going to do over here is we're going to say if this dot current direction is equal to moving direction of down right, then we're going to go ahead and do exactly the same thing we did for our down left. So I'm just going to copy this over here and we're going to make one little modification. That one little modification is after we're finished moving down, we're not going to move left. We're going to move right, just as this implies over here. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to set my value for my move down timer default from 80 back to 30, which I think is a great number. So let's try that. And here we go. We got our enemies hitting the wall and continuing to move down. And we've just completed moving our enemies on the screen for Space Invaders. Next, we're going to go ahead and create our player and draw our player to the screen. 
we'll start by creating our player file, player.js. Inside the player, we're going to do an export of default class player, and we'll create our constructor. We'll pass the canvas to our constructor and a velocity, and then we'll go ahead and we'll just assign those values to properties. Then we're also going to go ahead and set our X position for our player, and we're going to use the canvas.width and divide that by two to center our player on the screen. And we're going to set our Y position equal to this.canvas.height height and we're just arbitrarily going to minus 75 so we're going to go to the bottom of the canvas minus 75 so it pops our player up just a little bit then we'll also go ahead and set the width of our player so we're going to set that to 50 and we're going to set the height equal to 48 once again that's because of our player object is set to 50 and 48 for its width and height We'll go back to our player JS. We'll go ahead and create the image object and set the image object. So we'll create a new image and we'll say this.image.src is equal to images slash player dot png. Then we can go ahead and implement our draw method. We'll pass the CTX in and we'll call draw image. We'll pass in this.image, this.x, this.y, the width, and this.height. We'll go to our index.js and at the top of the file, we're going to import our player. Then below our enemy controller, we're going to go ahead and new up our player. We're going to pass in the canvas and a velocity. Then inside of our game, we're going to go ahead and draw our player. We're going to do that right after the enemy controller. And all we have to do is pass in the CTX and we have our player being drawn on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and comment out our enemy controller over here. Feel free to keep that on yours. However, I'm just going to eliminate it for now. So we just have our player on the screen. And the next thing we're going to focus on is keyboard input for moving our player. Inside of our player, we're going to go ahead and add two variables inside of the player class. We're going to add a right pressed is equal to false by default. And we'll add a left pressed is equal to false as well. Inside of our constructor, we're going to go ahead and register two events, key down and key up. We're going to use the document.addEventListener, event listener, and we're going to add one for key down. So it's all lowercase. And we're going to add a new function called key down. And then the second one's going to be document.addEventListener, event listener, and it's going to be key up all lowercase as well. And we'll add a function called key up. Then we're going to go ahead and define our key down event. Very important that this needs to be an arrow function. Otherwise, we need to bind this to the current object. Don't worry about that. But the thing that you need to know is it needs to be in this format, which is an arrow function. Otherwise, the this property will not work correctly. So we'll go if and we're going to do is we're going to check for the right arrow key. If the right arrow key is being pressed, then we're going to go ahead and set this dot right pressed equal to true. Then we can just copy that right there. The only change that we need to make is put left over here and put left over here. Then we'll go ahead and implement our key up. So all we have to do is copy our key down, rename it to key up and change our trues to false. Next, we'll go into our draw method and we're going to be calling a method called move, which is going to be responsible for responding to the keyboard events. We'll define our move method. Inside the move method, we're going to go ahead and we're going to use those variables that we defined. If right pressed is true, we're going to go ahead and take the x and say x, x plus equals this dot velocity, which is the number that we passed inside our constructor. After that, we're going to go ahead and check if if our left key is being pressed, if the left key is being pressed, we're going to go ahead and take our x position and we're going to plus equals the negative value of velocity since we'll be moving the left direction and going left is a negative number. I'll go ahead and zoom my screen back out over here and let's try our keyboard keys and yes we can move our spaceship to the left and to the right using our arrow keys. We just have one issue our spaceship can go off the canvas so let's go ahead and implement those boundary checks. Inside our draw method after the move method we'll implement a new method called collide with walls. 
and we'll just implement that below. We're going to start by checking the left wall. So we'll do an if statement, and we're gonna check if this dot x is less than zero. That means we've gone past the left wall. And if it is, we're gonna go ahead and set it back to zero. We'll move left, and we can't go any further. Next, we can check our right position. And what we're going to do is we're gonna say if this dot x is greater than this dot canvas dot width, since we passed in the canvas into our constructor, minus this dot width, so this is the player's width. What we're going to do is we're gonna say this dot x is equal to this dot canvas dot width. So we're taking the entire width of the canvas and then we're minusing the width of the player. Now let's try this out over here. Now what's happening is whenever we draw our player, we always start from this edge over here. So by minusing the width from the canvas, we're gonna start drawing our player from this position and it'll always be on the edge. Now we've assured that our player can move left and right and can't go off the canvas. And next, we're gonna focus on having our spaceship shoot bullets. The first thing we're gonna do is wire up the keyboard event. We'll add a variable called shoot pressed and we'll default it to false. Then we'll go down to our key down and key up and we'll add a if event.code is equal to space. Then we're gonna go ahead and set the shoot pressed to true for key down. And we can just copy this over here, go down to key up, paste it, and just set the value to false on key up. We'll then scroll up to our draw method. Inside the draw method, we'll check if shoot pressed is true. If it is true, for now, we're gonna go ahead and just print out a console log that says shoot. Let's go back to our game. If I hold the space bar, you're gonna say shoot increments inside the console. If I let go of it, it stops. In order to shoot bullets, we're gonna create something called a bullet controller. The bullet controller is going to control draw and showing the bullets on the screen and our player is going to be using this. So we're going to start by stubbing this out inside the player to see how we're going to be using the bullet controller. To start off with, let's go to our constructor. Now our constructor is going to be taking in a bullet controller. Then all we need to do is assign that bullet controller over here. Once we've assigned the bullet controller, we can go down to our draw method. We're going to get rid of that console.log and we're going to replace it with this dot bullet controller and we're going to call shoot now shoot is going to take in the x and y starting position so for the x starting position we're going to say plus this dot width divided by a two so what we're doing is we're taking the x position over here we're going this way for the full width then we're dividing it by two and ending up in the middle where we shoot our bullets from the spaceship then we can go ahead and we just want to put this dot y nothing changes over there since the y is going to be along the top and then i just want to provide the speed of the bullet which we're going to arbitrarily set to four and the last value is the gap between the bullets so when we shoot bullets if we don't put a gap it's just going to be one solid line like a laser so let's put a little gap over here for the time between bullets now, as I mentioned, this code doesn't exist yet. We've passed in a bullet controller that we've yet to create. What we've done over here is we've kind of prototyped how we want to use the bullet controller. We know that our bullet controller has a shoot method and that it takes in the following parameters. So let's go to the next step and start working on that bullet controller. To help guide us to that next step, let's go ahead and save our player and then go back to our game and hit space. If we hit space, we're gonna get an error. So the next error that we need to resolve is the fact that the bullet controller doesn't exist. It tells us that it cannot read properties of undefined. So it's trying to execute the shoot method on the bullet controller, which doesn't exist. Let's create our bullet controller. To start with, we're gonna go ahead and create a new file. Let's create a bullet controller dot JS. Inside the bullet controller, we'll do a export default class of bullet controller. We'll save that and then we're going to go back to our index.js. Inside the index.js, we're going to go ahead and import our bullet controller from our bullet controller.js. So make sure you have that correct. If you don't have it correct, you're going to get an error message in your console. So easy way to tell if the syntax is correct for the import. Now we're going to go ahead and new up a bullet controller for our player. Above our enemy controller over here and above our player, we can go ahead and implement our 
player bullet controller. So I'm deliberately naming this player bullet controller because we're also going to have an enemy bullet controller. So we're just going to make this equal to a new bullet controller. As you recall, we haven't defined what goes inside the constructor yet. So what we're going to be passing into our constructor is the following. Our bullet controller is going to know about the canvas. We have to know when bullets go off the canvas. And for our bullet controller, we also want to know the maximum number of bullets that can be on screen at any one time. So we're going to say our player can shoot a maximum of 10 bullets. As the bullets go off screen, you can shoot more bullets. But we're going to limit it to 10 just to make it slightly more challenging. But then we can also define the color of our bullet. So we're going to be drawing our bullets just using a rectangle and you can specify the color. The last variable we're going to pass in is whether or not sound is enabled. For the bullet controller that I've implemented here, we only have one sound, so I only want it to be enabled for the player. However, you could go ahead and modify this code so the bullet controller takes in a different sound for the player and for the enemies, then at least the sounds would be more distinctive. So feel free to expand on this and make it your own. Then we can take our player bullet controller and pass that into our player. So just be the third item in our constructor. Let's go ahead and implement our constructor. So back to our bullet controller, we'll create our constructor. The constructor is going to take in the canvas, the max bullets at a time. It will also take in the bullet color and the sound enabled. Then all we have to do is set up our properties. So just a lot of boiler plate over here. So we're setting our canvas, we're setting our max bullets at a time, we're setting the bullet color is equal to bullet color, and this dot sound enabled is equal to sound enabled. One more thing we'll do inside our constructor is go ahead and initialize our shoot sound. We're going to make that equal to a new audio object. We're going to go to the sounds directory, get the shoot dot wave. So this should have been a file at the beginning beginning of the project that you added. If you haven't done that yet, go ahead and create a sounds directory. Go ahead and get the shoot.wave and the instructions are in the description for how to get that. And then we'll go ahead and we'll just set the volume. I noticed the volume was a little bit loud on this sound, so I'm going to set it to 0 0.5. So it's just cutting the volume in half. Now if we go back to our game and we hit space, we're going to get a different error for our bullet controller. This time it's letting us know that the shoot method doesn't exist. Easy way to fix that is we add our shoot method over here, click save, and try shooting with space. And now we won't be getting an error. However, we should be passing in the correct parameters. So let's go ahead and and do that. Our shoot method is taking in the x, the y, the velocity, and the time till next bullet allowed. And we're going to go ahead and set the time till next bullet allowed to zero by default if it's not specified. Two things that we're going to require inside of our bullet controller are a list of bullets and a value for the time till next bullet allowed that we're going to be checking when we shoot bullets. At the top of our bullet controller, we'll go ahead and implement a bullets array, which will hold all the bullets, and we'll also set that time till next bullet allowed equal to zero. It's important to set this value to zero over here in the mechanics that we're going to be writing, because as soon as you hit space, we want that first bullet to be fired. The first thing that we're going to do inside of our shoot method over here is we're going to go ahead and do an if statement. And we're going to check if the time till next bullet allowed is less than or equal to zero. So when this number is set to a positive number like 20 or something, we're going to continue to decrement it every single time we call the draw method. So it starts at 10, we draw once, it goes down to 9, then 8. As soon as we hit zero, we're allowed to add more bullets. The other thing we're going to check as well is we're going to check the bullet's length. So we're going to look at our bullet its length and we're going to check if it is less than this dot max bullets at a time. So these are the variables that we added earlier. We said that we can only have a certain number of bullets on the screen at one time. So we're going to set a number and we're going to check that our bullets length is less than that. And we'll also check that we're allowed to shoot a bullet, which is creating that gap between the bullets. Then what we want to do is we want to create a bullet. Now this doesn't exist. We're going to have to go and implement a bullet. The bullet that we're creating will look like this. And once again, we're kind of prototyping ahead of time. This class doesn't exist, but we're going to pass the canvas into our bullet. We're going to give it an X and Y position, the same ones we pass in to shoot. Then we'll also give it the velocity and we're going to give it the bullet color because we can change the color of our bullet. We're going to have one color for the player and one color for the enemies. 
If we go ahead and try shooting a bullet by pressing space in our game, we're going to get an error telling us that bullet doesn't exist. And next, let's go implement our bullet class. We'll go to our solution explorer and we're going to add a new file. It's going to be bullet.js. We're going to do an export default class of bullet and we'll implement our bullet constructor, which takes in the canvas, the X, the Y, the velocity, and the bullet color. Then it's boilerplate once again, just setting these values up. So we're just going to set all these values so they're accessible to us on this class. We'll set the velocity as well and the bullet color. We're also going to set the dimensions of our bullet. So the width will be 5 and the height will be 20. This will make a rectangular shape for the bullet. Now let's go back to our bullet controller and we're just going to import our bullet. We'll import bullet from our current directory and get the bullet.js. Now, if we go back to our app over here and we hit space, we're not going to get that error telling us that the bullet doesn't exist. We'll go back to our shoot method on the bullet controller. And what we're going to do next is we're going to take the bullet that we've created and push it onto the array of bullets that we have. So this is the array of bullets that we've defined at the top of our page over here, bullets. So we've added that bullet to the list. Then we can go ahead and play our sound. It will do an if statement over here. If this dot sound is enabled, then we're going to go ahead and play the sound. So we'll do this dot shoot sound dot play. One last little thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and tell our sound to set its current time to zero before we call play. Sometimes the sound may already be playing and we just want to reset the time back to zero. And then lastly, we're going to say our time till next bullet allowed is equal to time till next bullet allowed that we're passing into the function. As you can see, it's after this if statement, but it could be before it if you want. The main thing is that it's inside this main if over here. Now that we've implemented this code over here, if we go ahead and hit space in our game, you're going to hear a single bullet fire. And the reason you're only hearing a single bullet fire is because of this if statement over here. We're only adding one bullet to the list because our time till next bullet allowed is never less than or equal to zero. It's 10, which is what we set inside of our player. So we go back to our player. You can see the value that we passed in is 10. So the next thing we need to do is we need to decrement this value and then also draw our bullets to the screen. So let's start with our index.js. We'll go back to our index.js and what we're going to do is we're going to tell our player bullet controller to draw. So we can go ahead and copy that name. And then inside of our game loop, we're going to go ahead and call the draw method, which doesn't exist yet, on our player bullet controller. Now you'll see an error message in our console, and we're going to go ahead and implement the draw method. We'll go back to our bullet controller. In the bullet controller, let's create that draw method, pass in the CTX, hit save, and you'll see that the error message goes away. Let's take care of one simple little thing inside of our draw method. We're going to take care of the time till next bullet allowed. We're going to check if the value is greater than zero. If the value is greater than zero, then we can go ahead and decrement the value. So go ahead and minus that value. Well, let's go back to our game. If I go ahead and press space, you're going to hear it shoot another space it'll shoot and then if i hold it it's going to shoot a bunch of times and then the reason it's not shooting anymore is because we've reached the maximum number of bullets that we can have on the screen well the maximum number of bullets that are in the array which translate to the screen the next thing we need to do is draw our bullets and then when the bullets go off screen we need to remove them you might also notice that i have this fave icon error over here let's just quickly remove that because it is a little bit distracting we're going to go back to our index.html just put in a link shortcut icon, set the href to pound, and then that error should go away. Just a quick little tip so we can keep our console clean. We'll go back to our bullet controller and within the draw method, we're going to go ahead and draw our bullets now. Just before our if statement for the time till next bullets allowed, we'll do a this.bullets dot for each. And on each bullet, we're going to go ahead and call draw. 
So we're just going to use an arrow function called draw on the bullet and pass in CTX. Now let's go try firing a bullet. When we try firing a bullet, we're going to get an error letting us know that the draw method doesn't exist on our bullet. Let's go to our bullet. Inside our bullet, let's create a draw method and pass in the CTX. Save it. Now in our game, let's go ahead and shoot. We can hear the sound and we're no longer getting an error message. The first thing we'll do inside our draw method is we'll go ahead and we'll set the Y. For the Y, we're gonna set that equal to minus equals the velocity. And the reason for that is we start at zero, zero over here. And as we go down this way, it's a positive number. So we want our bullet to start here. In order to shoot it up, we need to go negative. So we're gonna change the Y position of the bullet from down here to up here with a negative number. Then we're going to do a ctx.fill style and we're going to get that color from our this.bullet color that we pass into the constructor. Then all we have to do is draw that rectangle using fill rectangle, pass in the x, pass in the y, and then give it the width and give it the height. Let's go ahead and give this a try. As you can see, we're shooting our bullets, we can hear the sound but we can only shoot a certain number of bullets. I can't shoot past 10 bullets. I'm trying to shoot right now and nothing is happening. So when the bullets go off screen, we need to remove those bullets. Let's go ahead and do that. And just as a quick little reminder, I don't have the enemies on the screen as I've commented them out just because I'm saving a lot and it might be a little distracting. However, you most likely have them on your screen and this is what you're seeing right now is that if you shoot, it shoots right through them. We're going to deal with collision detection after we're finished with the bullets. Let's go back to our bullet controller and into the draw method. And let's just do a little console.log and we're going to print out the bullets length. So let's print that out. Now, every time I shoot, you're going to see that number go up over there. So let's shoot again and see the number go up, four, five, six, I'm holding the button. And once we get to 10, it stops adding bullets to the bullets list. So let's handle that right here by removing the bullets that have gone off the screen. The easiest way to handle this is inside our draw method. And we're going to do it just above the console.log. And what we're going to do is we're going to say this.bullets is equal to this.bullets.filter. And we're going to filter for only the bullets that are currently visible on the screen. Screen. So let's focus on just the bullets that are shooting up. So we'll pass in, in our arrow function. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check the bullet. So we're going to say the bullet dot y plus the bullet dot width is greater than zero. So that means basically the bullet is below this point. If the bullet is here or here, its number is going to say be 10 or 11 or 20 or something like that, which is greater than zero. So it was only going to find me the bullets that are on the screen. We can go ahead and test that out by firing a few bullets here and you can see the number go up and then slowly the number goes back down to zero. We don't have our enemies shooting bullets just yet but when our enemies do shoot bullets they're also going to go off the screen but they're going to go off the screen at the bottom. We need to make sure that our bullets are actually between the top of our canvas and the bottom of our canvas. In order to do that all we have to do is just add an and over here and we're looking for bullets where the y position is less than or equal to this.canvas dot height. As long as it's less than the height and greater than zero, then the bullets will still stay on the screen. So I'll save that again. We won't make any difference here, but we just want to make sure that shooting our bullets off screen works. And if we hold that button, you can see the gap there. We only have 10 bullets on screen. So it gives us a little bit more of a challenge because you can only shoot so many bullets at a time. However, it's highly configurable and you can change that number in the constructor. Let's go back to our index.js. Let's change our bullet controller so that it's only shooting two bullets at a time and just give that a quick test. And you see two bullets, they go off screen and then I can shoot two more. I'm gonna go ahead and change that back to 10 because 10 is way more fun. Now that we have our bullet controller, let's create a bullet controller for our enemies. So just like we have our player controller over here, we're going to create const enemy bullet controller is equal to new bullet controller. And inside our bullet controller, we're going to pass in the canvas just like we did before. And we'll pass in four for the number of bullets on screen. We're going to make the bullets the color white and we're not going to play any sound for the enemy bullets so we're going to set it to false. Then on our enemy controller we can go ahead and pass in our enemy 
bullet controller. I'll also start drawing the enemies to the screen again. Now the whole idea here is the player is going to be able to shoot and the enemies will be able to shoot but neither of our bullets will be causing collisions. After we get that out of the way we'll focus on the collisions next. Let's go to our enemy controller. Inside the enemy controller we'll go to the constructor and inside the constructor we're going to go ahead and pass in the enemy bullet controller. This is very purposely named because later on when we're working on collisions we're going to pass in the player bullet controller. So I just want to give them very distinct names. We'll assign that property to this. I've gone ahead and set the default X velocity to zero so the enemies are not moving every time I click the save button. However, feel free to leave it on your version. It's what I did when I originally made the game but while I'm making the video, a little bit easier to have them staying still. Inside of our enemy controller, we're gonna go ahead and set up a couple of more properties. We're gonna set up a fire bullet timer default value, which we're going to set to 100. And this is the timer that we're going to use to decide when to fire a bullet. We're gonna say our fire bullet timer by default is equal to the default value for it. So the fire bullet timer default value. And then we're just going to decrement that value every single time we do a draw. Inside the draw method, we're going to go ahead and call a new method called fire bullet. And then we'll implement that method below. Inside that method, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the fire bullet timer and we're going to decrement it. Then when the fire bullet timer is less than or equal to zero, we're going to go ahead and fire a bullet. However, the first thing we're going to do is reset the fire bullet timer. And we're going to say that's equal to this dot fire bullet timer default value. Then we're going to go ahead and create a variable called all enemies, which is going to be equal to our enemy rows dot flat. So we're going to take our two dimensional array and make it into a one dimensional array. So that means when I call length on this, it'll give me the number of enemies that I have. Then what we need to do is we need to get a random index for our enemy. So we're going to find our enemy index and we're going to say that's equal to a random number. So the way we do this is I'm going to take whatever number we get and I'm going to round it down. I'm going to call math dot random just give us a number between 0 and 1 so it could be a decimal number like 0 0.3 0 0.4 then what we're going to do is I'm going to times that by all enemies dot length so that's going to be the number of enemies that we have that's going to give us a random index then we're going to use that enemy index to get the enemy so the next thing we do is we define an enemy is equal to all enemies and inside there we get our enemy by the enemy index that we just got so like that and that gives us an enemy then all we have to do is use our enemy bullet controller call shoot just like we do on our player and we just have to pass in a few variables so the enemy x position the y position and then the speed of the bullet we have to supply a negative number because we want our bullet to go down. Now it's counterintuitive to how the canvas works because a negative typically means going up, but because of the way we created our bullet controller, all we have to do is supply the opposite number. We can save that. Seeing no errors is a really good sign. We're not drawing shooting the bullets yet, but one thing we could do is inside of our if statement over here is we could print out the enemy index which will be shooting the bullet. If we look at our console log, we're gonna see a number appearing, and that that's the index of the enemy that's going to be shooting a bullet on the screen. So you can see it's picking random numbers. If you have this working over here, that means you're in good shape. Now that we're adding our bullets to the enemy bullet controller, we can go ahead and draw those bullets. Let's go back to our index.js and inside the game method, we'll go ahead and draw our bullets. All we have to do is call enemy bullet controller and call the draw method, just like we do above for the player bullet controller. And then if we watch the screen, we're going to see that our enemies can now fire bullets at random. Next, we're going to go ahead and focus on collision detection. As you can see, when our spaceship gets hit, the spaceship doesn't get destroyed. And when the player shoots bullets, our enemies aren't destroyed either. First, we're going to focus on our spaceship being able to shoot our enemies. When we shoot the enemy, the enemy should disappear from the screen. The way we're going to do this inside of our index.js, we're going to pass the player bullet controller 
to our enemy controller as another argument. So our enemy controller is in fact going to have two bullet controllers. It's going to have the one it uses to shoot and it's going to have the player bullet controller which we're going to use to check for collision detection. So then we can go inside our enemy controller and then inside the constructor all we do is add that player bullet controller, assign it to a variable, and next we can go ahead and implement the collision detection. Inside the draw method, after we update the velocity and direction, we're then going to go ahead and add a new method called collision detection, and we'll just implement that method below. Inside collision detection, we're going to go ahead and loop over the enemy rows, and we'll do a for each. We're going to do an arrow function, so the parameter will be the enemy row and inside the body of that we're going to go ahead and loop over that enemy row and do another for each and this is going to have two parameters it's going to have the enemy and it's going to have the enemy index and that'll be another arrow function and then inside here what we're going to do is we're going to ask the player bullet controller if there is a collision with any of the bullets for this enemy. It's going to use the x and y and the width and height to determine if there is a collision between this enemy and any of the bullets. Then what we can do is we can play a sound. So we'll wire that up after. Anytime we eliminate an enemy, we'll play a sound. And then lastly, all we have to do is remove the enemy. So we can take our enemy row and we can use an array method called splice, which can remove an item. All we have to do is give it the index of the item that we want to remove. And lucky for us, we got the enemy index right here so we know which enemy we want to remove if this if statement is true so we'll just add index end of that and then how many items do we want to remove starting at the index well we just want to remove one so we save that after we click save, we're going to notice in the console that we have an error. The collide with method doesn't exist yet. We're going to go implement that shortly. We're just going to do one last thing over here is after we remove enemies, we might end up with enemy rows that have no enemies at all. So we just want to update our list to reflect that. So we're going to take our enemy rows array and we're going to reassign it. So we're going to reassign it to an array that has filtered out all of the empty enemy rows. And it just takes in an arrow function. The parameter is the enemy row. And then all we're checking is the length of that row and checking if it's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, we're going to keep it. Otherwise, it's going to get removed. And then this is a result over here is going to give us a new array, which we're going to assign over here that will not have any empty rows of enemies. Now we can go into our bullet controller and implement the collide with method. So let's go to our bullet controller and inside the bullet controller we'll just add a method over here called collide with and it's going to take in a sprite. We're going to make it a more general name instead of enemy as it can also be the player. Then, then the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define a variable called bullet that hit sprite index. And then we're going to take a look at all our bullets and we're going to find the index of the bullet that is hitting our sprite. The way that this works is it takes in an arrow function for find index and we're going to ask each bullet did it collide with our sprite? I'll just save that so it's a little clearer to look at. If it did collide with a the bullet, then it's going to go ahead and return the index. This will be any number from zero and above. And if it doesn't find one, then bullet that hits sprite index will be a negative number. So to handle this, we'll just do an if statement. We're going to say that if a bullet that hit sprite index is greater than or equal to zero, then that means a bullet hit. And if a bullet hit, we can go ahead and remove it from the bullet's list. All we have to do is use the splice method, pass in the bullet that hit index, and say that we want to remove one item from that list. Then all we have to do is go ahead and return true. If a bullet didn't hit our sprite, then we're going to go ahead and return false at the end of this method. Now, if we go ahead and we fire a bullet, we're going to get a crash immediately over here. Let's take a look at this. Our bullet.collidewith is not a function. So down the rabbit hole we go, one method after another, implementing it until we've implemented them all. So next, let's go down to the bullet and we're going to implement another collide with method. I promise this is the last one. This is the one that's actually going to do the collision. We'll go to our solution explorer, we'll go to bullet.js, and then we'll implement a collide with method. That collide with method will take in a sprite, 
The collision detection that we're going to be using is just two boxes colliding into each other. There's a really great MDN article on this that I'll share in the description. It's this one over here, axis aligned bounding boxes. Basically, if the two boxes are hitting each other, we will be considering that a collision. So if we go back to our code, the code is going to be kind of straightforward. You would just have to understand it, but it's not too bad. We take our X position, we add the width to it, and we say, is it greater than our sprite dot X? Then we do another end and we take our X and we say, is it less than our sprite dot X plus our sprite dot width? And we just do another and, such as the series of ands, checks in whether or not the two of them are colliding. We're then gonna add the height, and then we'll just do greater than our sprite dot y. And then one last and is we're just gonna take this dot y is less than our sprite dot y plus our sprite dot height. Then if that is true, we will return true from our function, meaning that yes, there is a collision. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and return false because the two objects are not colliding with each other. And if we've done this all right, we can go back to our game, fire a bullet, and an enemy will be removed from the screen. Right now, when we shoot the enemies, our bullets make sound, but our enemies don't make any sounds when we eliminate them. Let's go back to our enemy controller, and inside the constructor of our enemy controller, we'll add a sound object for when the enemies are eliminated. We'll call it enemy death sound, and we'll make that equal to a new audio object. And we just need to give it the path to the sounds. So if we go to our explorer, expand the sounds, we can find the name of that file, which I'll copy. Then I'll go back to the file and I'll paste that in over here. So we're going to sound slash enemy death dot wave. And then just like our bullets, I'm going to go ahead and take that sound and actually decrease the volume of it. All we have to do is grab the volume property and set it to 0.5. Then we can scroll down to our collision method and where we put that comment about playing a sound, we're gonna remove the comment, say this dot enemy death sound dot play. And we'll also set the, the current time for the enemy death sound back to zero so that if multiple enemies are dying at the same time, it's not waiting to finish playing that sound. And we'll go ahead and we'll set the current time equal to zero. So every time it plays, it starts fresh. Let's save and give that a try. To make this a little bit more fun, let's get our enemies moving on the screen. So I'm just going to set my velocity back to one over here. And now our enemies are shooting at us and we can shoot at them, but their bullets aren't killing our player yet. So let's go ahead and get our enemy bullets to destroy our player and cause a game over. In addition to that, we also need our enemies to collide with our player. If we speed our enemies up right now, so let's speed up our X to 5 and 5 over here. That should be pretty fast. Now watch. They're just going to pass right over the spaceship. So we got two last things to handle for a game over. The enemy bullets hitting us and us colliding with the enemies. Let's go to our index.js and above our game loop, we'll define a new variable called isGameOver and we'll set it to false. Inside of the game loop, one of the first things we'll do is we'll just do a check. So we'll call check game over and we'll define that function below our game. And inside check game over, the first thing we're going to check is if it is game over. So we're going to check that variable. And if that variable is true, we're just going to return from this function. That's it. We're not going to do a single thing. If it's not game over, we're going to do a couple of checks. The first check we're going to do is we're going to ask our enemy bullet controller if there is a collision with our player. If there's a collision with our player from any of the enemy bullets, then we're going to go ahead and set is game over to true. Let's go ahead and test this out by adding a console.log inside of our game loop. And what we're going to do is we're going to print out whether or not it's a game over. So pay attention over here. It says false. Now, if I collide into one of these bullets, now it says true. Isn't that pretty amazing? We were able to use our enemy bullet controller and simply pass in our player because of all the work that we did inside the bullet controller to make it generic. 
pretty amazing sometimes how you can just reuse some code that you've written to make something a lot quicker to implement, just as we did with our player colliding with the bullets. Now we can go ahead and use our game over variable. If it's not game over, we can continue to draw our game. So we'll just do that inside our game loop and we'll check if it's not game over, put our curly braces around every single draw method that we have. So if it's not game over, the game continues to run as normal. But as soon as I hit one of these bullets over here, you can see that it stops drawing to the screen. This also gives us an opportunity to display some game over text. Let's go ahead and do that. So right now we have this is game over variable that we're setting to false. So let's also define another one did win. And we're also going to set that one to false. Right above our if statement over here, we're going to call a new function display game over and we'll define that below over here. Inside game over, we're simply just going to be displaying some text to say either you win or it's game over. And we don't do this often in the tutorial, but I'm just going to paste this in over here for just displaying text on the screen. But I've also done just a little bit of massaging to try and get the you win and the game over centered. So let's go ahead and save that. Now, if we get hit by that bullet, then it will be game over. So it says game over on the screen. So what's happening is this method is executing. It's going inside here. It's checking that it is game over. Then it's determining whether or not you won or it is game over. And then displaying the appropriate text. The next game over scenario that we're going to deal with is if our enemies hit our player. So right now our enemies can cross over our player. If we go back to our enemy controller, we increase the value to five over here. So they move really quick, but they go right over our player. So let's go back to our index.js and inside our check a game over, we'll do another if statement. And this time we're going to check our enemy controller and we're going to check the collide with method which doesn't exist but we're going to be creating and we're just going to pass in our player and then if that is true we're going to go ahead and set the is game over to true we save that we're going to get an error because collide with doesn't exist so let's go to our enemy controller we can implement this at the very bottom and then we'll just create the method over here. We'll add collide with. Collide with takes in a sprite. Click save and the game should be working again. Collision is not happening just yet. Inside collide with, we're going to go ahead and do a return. Then we're going to take our enemy rows and we're going to flatten that into one list. And we're going to use the sum function. So as soon as our arrow function inside here returns true, sum is going to return right away. And we're just going to call collide with on our enemy. If none of the enemies collide with return true, then it's going to go ahead and return false from sum. So what we have to do is pass our sprite in. When we save it, we'll get an error letting us know the collide with doesn't exist. So then we can go implement collide with on our enemy and we'll just jump to our enemy. We'll create a function. It will take in a sprite and then inside the body of this function, it's going to be very similar to the one that we have in the bullet. So it means maybe we made this a generic function somewhere, but we can go ahead and copy this for now from our bullet, but definitely something we can refactor in the future to make the code more cleaner. Now we get a game over whenever our enemies hit the player. The very last thing we have to do is implement winning the game. To win the game, we have to destroy all the enemies. To check if we've won the game, all we have to do is check if all the enemies have been eliminated. It's really simple to do. All we do is go to our enemy controllers, get our enemy rows, check the length, see if the length is equal to zero. If the length is equal to zero, that means we won the game. We destroyed all the enemies and we can go ahead and set did win to true is game over to true as well save now we'll go back to our enemy controller go change the speed of those enemies because that is way too fast change it back to one let's go ahead and win the game we'll go ahead and shoot our enemies and avoid being hit by the bullets in this video, we covered a lot of topics, enemies, keyboard input, collision detection. As you can see, it's just a lot of fun being able to hear the sounds and move our spaceship around knowing that we created this. And we'll just get those last couple of space invaders. Congratulations, you've made the Space Invaders game using JavaScript and an HTML canvas. I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial as much as I did making it and learned a lot of JavaScript along the way. If you enjoy my videos, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell.